This is a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell. We are just moments away from one of the most majestic and historic things that many of us will see in our lifetime. For the final time, Queen Elizabeth II will leave Buckingham Palace, her longtime home. In just moments, the Queen's coffin, adorned with the imperial state crown and a wreath of flowers, will travel in solemn procession through the heart of London to Westminster Hall. The symbolism and significance of today cannot be understated, pulling together hundreds of years of tradition and pageantry. And soon we will see a grieving royal family. For the second time this week, the king, the new king, will walk behind his mother in mourning. And we will also see Princes William and Harry together. United in grief, a scene similar to what we saw 25 years ago at the funeral of their mother, Princess Diana. The crowds this morning, enormous. Thousands are already lining the procession route, and they're also in line outside Westminster Hall where the Queen will lie in state for four days. Mourners have already been told they may be in line for up to 30 hours. You can see the cannons already in place, and while this will be a silent procession for the most part of the morning, you will hear not only Big Ben, but also these cannons. We saw huge crowds on Monday and Tuesday at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, the Scottish capital, where King Charles stood vigil. And for the first time in two years, remember, we saw Prince William and Prince Harry and their wives together outside Windsor Castle on Saturday, greeting mourners and viewing the flowers left behind for their grandmother. Last night is, look at those pictures from last night, the Queen returned to Buckingham Palace where she lived for most of her life and her coffin laid overnight in the bow room so royal family and household staff could bid their matriarch farewell in private. We will see some of the household staff in today's procession. Those now are the preparations already underway as this has been meticulously planned by not only the palace, but by the queen herself. Let's bring in Holly Williams. She is outside Buckingham Palace where there are huge crowds again this morning. And Holly, the significance, the history today that we are about to witness. That, that's absolutely correct, Nora. Um, this is essentially the handing over of the Queen's coffin from her family, that is the royal family, uh, to the state. In about 22 minutes time, uh, we will see her coffin leave Buckingham Palace, travel down this road uh, that you can see behind me where thousands have gathered to watch this procession. Uh, the coffin will be drawn uh, on a gun carriage. It will travel down this road, which is called the Mall, uh, then through horse guards. Uh, that is the home, the stables of the household cavalry. Then it will move down Whitehall. That's the home of the British bureaucracy. And it will finish up at around three o'clock local time at the Palace of Westminster. That's the home of the British Parliament, where the Queen will lie in state for four full days uh, inside Westminster Hall. That is an ancient medieval building uh, that was built uh, in 1097. Now, the authorities here are expecting around 750,000 members of the public to file past the Queen's coffin to pay their last respects uh, with lines expected up to five miles long. Uh, as you said last night, we saw that incredibly moving ceremony as the Queen's uh, coffin essentially returned home. She grew up a stone's throw from here in Mayfair. She would have been in and out of this palace as a child and it was her main home from her coronation through until 2020 when she moved out to Windsor Castle uh, because of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, there are reports that the royal family had essentially a family dinner last night inside Buckingham Palace. We can't confirm that, but it, it's, a, it's hardly surprising. When her coffin returned here to Buckingham Palace yesterday evening, we caught a glimpse of some of the members of the royal family through the windows, through the doorway, including King Charles, as well as Harry and Meghan. Holly Williams, thank you. I want to bring in Wesley Kerr, a former BBC royal correspondent and a historian. And Wesley, I'm thinking about just how historic this is, not only because Queen of Queen Elizabeth II's reign, but also the last state funeral held at Westminster was for Winston Churchill in 1965. 
Yes, I mean, Winston Churchill's state funeral, in fact, at St. Paul's Cathedral, um, but, but incredibly resonant. And of course, Her Majesty was, was present. It was, I think, the first time that a monarch had been to the funeral of a prime minister. So, so, so state funerals are incredibly rare in this country. Only for Winston Churchill, I think the Duke of Wellington, Lord Nelson, and for monarchs. But the last time there was a ceremonial procession like we're about to see, and I remember, was for Her Majesty's mother, Elizabeth the Queen Mother, in 2002. But she was a queen consort, not a sovereign monarch. So, so, so that wasn't a state funeral. But, but um, in the middle of this ceremonial and this history, of course, is, is a family. So it's, 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 it's been extraordinary balance. So how tough for them all, all the children, Her Majesty's children, to walk behind in front of hundreds of thousands of people. I think it will take 38 minutes precisely. And on every minute, there will be a gun salute from Hyde Park nearby and also Big Ben. And the, 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 there'll, there'll be a, a marching band, but, but solemn music. There'll be the sound of the horses. And at the centre of this, this majestic gun parriage on which were, were born the King's remains in 1952, Her Majesty's father and her grandfather's remains, draped in the royal standard and the astonishing sight of the imperial state crown which Her Majesty wore on the day of her coronation and which she wore to open, par open Parliament. So, you know, this is a great head of state, one of the great heads of state in history, the head of the Commonwealth, the Supreme Governor of the Church of England, the head of the armed forces. So this is the British nation formally saying thank you at the beginning of the obsequies and the lying in state. And of course, religion will also be at the centre of this when the body arrives in the amazing Westminster Hall, as we've heard, dating back to the, the son of William the Conqueror. So just think of that, the 1090s. And Elizabeth, I think, is the 41st monarch since William the Conqueror. And the monarchy itself goes back two centuries before that, both in England and in Scotland. Mm. And Elizabeth, like her son Charles, is descended from those previous monarchs. So it is the most astonishing concentration of history in ceremonial. We're seeing our constitution. Oh, that is so well put, Wesley. And uh, that's right, Winston Churchill did lie in state in Westminster Hall, of course, which dates back to the 11th century, the richness of tradition in London, of course. And I want to bring in Julian Payne, is a CBS News royal contributor and a former communications director for the former Prince of Wales, now King Charles. Julian, thank you so much for joining us. And as we think about the Queen's last journey from her home, I'm also thinking about the family because they will surround the coffin as it makes its way through some of the most important symbols of London. That's absolutely right. Uh, in many ways, what we see happening today, uh, as has been said, is the family, her own family, giving the Queen back to the people. So what we'll have had last night was that last private moment for members of her family to gather in quiet reflection, alone, away from the media, away from anybody else, and just have a chance to say what they want to say and to make their own private goodbyes. We understand that they then subsequently had dinner together. And I think that this is a moment when the whole family will have had a chance to perhaps pause and reflect on what has been a, a, a very sad time, but an incredibly busy time as well. Don't forget, as soon as one sovereign breathes their last, so a new king or queen is immediately taking over. And for the new king, he has been traveling. Uh, he has been obviously in London, but he's been in Belfast. He's been in uh, Scotland, in Edinburgh, in Balmoral. So, they have all been moving around and I suspect last night actually was one of the first times for them all just to take a breath um, because such has been the focus on all of them. Um, today obviously the focus moves away from the King back to the Queen as she moves to uh, West Palace of Westminster and then begins this lying in state and the public having its chance to pay its last respects and as has been noted those queues have been building up for, for several days already now. And Julian, why was it so important to bring the Queen back to Buckingham Palace rather than just go straight to Westminster? 
Yeah, it's a really uh, good point. There's, there's two reasons. One is very practical. As Wesley says, it, it is everything is timed with military precision. And in order for these plans to have been put in place over many years, they have always needed to be certain where that stepping off point was. Now, nobody could know where the monarch would ultimately breathe her last, but it was possible for them to plan around a starting point for this final leg of the journey. But also, to be, to be very honest, this is, of course, her home as well. And it is entirely fitting that she should leave her home for the last time rather than simply be flown straight to, the, to this uh, Palace of Westminster to meet uh, members of the public. So it's both a, a very personal reason, but also quite a practical one as well. Julian Payne, thank you. And we are just minutes away from that procession beginning, so let me walk you through it. Today's ceremony will start at Buckingham Palace. The Queen's coffin will be carried east along the ceremonial boulevard known as the Mall on a gun carriage of the King's Troop, the Royal Horse Artillery. Then the procession will turn south before traveling along Whitehall past 10 Downing Street, home of the Prime Minister, and arriving at Westminster Hall near the Houses of Parliament. There will be a short religious service after the coffin arrives, and then the doors will be opened to the public for the next four days. And police have already been warning people that they will have to wait many hours to pay their final respects to the Queen. Just enormous crowds already, and Charlie Daggett, uh, is there amongst the crowds and uh, Charlie in many ways so many people have traveled throughout and from the United Kingdom to be here. Yeah, well, Nora, you know, you were here a couple of days ago. You've seen the tens of thousands of people who have been gathering here outside of Buckingham Palace and now down the mall, as you said. We're about two-thirds of the way down the mall at Duke of York Steps. And this morning we were walking through and we were setting up and more people were arriving. They've actually limited the number of people. There would be many more here if they could have let them in. And they wanted to be here because this isn't, you know, just a moment in history. You know, this is personal for the people of London. They've been watching these incredible ceremonies in Scotland, but in a way, this is, this is their queen. The queen's a Londoner. They consider her a Londoner. Buckingham Palace is her place of business, and they've been sharing stories with us about these are the kind of people that come out for royal weddings, you know, for the Jubilee, the ones who gather here because they want to feel that personal connection to the Queen. And there's nothing more personal than a day like today when you actually see the coffin passing by. So it was you know, vitally important. There are a lot of kids here, you know, a lot of parents are saying, I wanted my children to witness this. Um, it hasn't, we haven't seen a state funeral, as you've, you've already said, in, in generations. Um, people have told us about meeting Prince Charles. It was one woman said that she met Prince Charles when she was just a child, never knowing that, you know, he would eventually be king in her lifetime. It's because even though all of this has been heavily choreographed and the queen was 96 years old, what you can't prepare for is, is grief. I mean, it still came as a shock to the people of Britain because they saw her just over a week ago, you know, in photos with that mischievous smile. And then, you know, a couple of days later, we all got news that she had died. And so it still came as a shock to the people of, of Britain. There's been this outpouring of emotion. I really mean that. I mean, it's, it's she's a head of state, but she's a grandmother and, and she's a figurehead. And what you constantly hear, she's, she's been a constancy in people's lives, uh, in my wife's life, in my children's lives. They've never known another monarch. And, and bizarrely, they feel a personal connection because of what the royal family represents. It's said time and time again, the family part of the royal family is very important. And that's what Brits connect to. Are they part of the Queen's royal family? Not at all, but they feel part of it when they take part in something like this. It's so true, Charlie, as I spoke with people, not just sort of a symbol of constancy, but also a symbol of strength, <laughs> taking many people not only through the historic highs and lows, but also personal ones, where people felt because of even what happened in her own family with her children, with divorces and tragedy, that they could relate with her. 
Yes, and when we say that she's a beloved queen, and King Charles has said that time and time again, you very rarely hear the word uh, my mother without my beloved mother in front of it. And that is the way people feel because she has been a rock. She's been through the trials and tribulations of this country, and this country is in real trouble. You know, we have a, a new prime minister, uh, the economy is in tatters, people are really looking for hope, and, and she stood as that sort of figure of hope, uh, in a way connected to the government being the head of state, but in a way being away from it as well, and being this this family um, sort of role model. And, and we talk about the stoicism and the stiff upper lip. Uh, there can be a positive about that, too. You know, somebody who just steadies the ship through some of the most difficult times, and, and that is what she represented. Having said that, you know, there's been this great support for King Charles in the past few days. There's been a lot of skepticism as to whether he could follow that, that act, which is going to be difficult. Um, mm. But for now, anyway, we may be in the honeymoon phase, but people here are willing and ready to support this new king. But, you know, she will not be easily replaced. She's everywhere you look, especially now. And it's it's really going to tear a bit of the soul out of this country with her passing. Charlie Daggett, thank you. Let's bring in CBS News royal contributor Tina Brown. And Tina, you wrote the most incredible piece this weekend um, in which you talked about the ability of uh, the queen to stand above the brawling partisan power. She alone could unite the nation in times of national joy or anxiety. That's absolutely right. You know, when uh, Prince Charles, uh, just, just shortly before the Queen's coronation, Prince, the four-year-old Prince Charles walked into her study and there she was trying on her crown. And she say, he said, what are you doing? And she said, I want to feel how heavy it is. And one really feels that she understood figuratively and literally the weight of that crown. And she took it on. She said yes to it. And she always did. And now, of course, the British public are saying thank you to this extraordinary uh, following of her duty all of her days, I mean, all the days of her life, as she promised that she would do. And she kept her pledge, as Charles said. It was a you know, an appointment with destiny kept, which was a, a, you know, a wonderful way to put it. Tina Brown, stay with us. So much to talk about as we witness uh, this historic moment. I want to bring back in our historian and former BBC royal correspondent, Wesley Kerr. And Wesley, because now we are just minutes away from this procession beginning, and I wonder if you could describe what we're seeing now and what we'll see in just the coming moments. So you're seeing the mull, obviously, with, with lots of Union flags along it. And at the end of this grand ceremonial route, um, the central entrance of Buckingham Palace, the grand entrance, so many times Her Majesty went through that entrance. I remember the day she came back to the palace after Princess Diana died, and that was where she met the crowds. I was standing in exactly the same place. But so many of the great events of this reign have taken place here. So she, it's Her Majesty's Guard, it's the Grenadier Guards, it's the Horse Guards. So just as they escorted her in life, they will escort her in death. Um, among the bearer party will be 10 former equerries, her, her personal military attendants, who are on a sort of three-year rotation. So these are people that will have worked with her immensely closely, members of the household, the heads of departments, some of whom I know, Michael Vernon, Tim Knox, they will be marching. But at the head, behind the coffin, will be 10 members of the royal family, nine men and um, the Princess Royal, so the, the Queen's children, led, of course, by the King, all four of the children, and other senior members of the family, such, um, perhaps not as well known to your audience, but very, very close to her, people like the, the, the Duke of Gloucester. So, so, yeah. so very, very significant scenes we're about to see. I will ask you, Wesley, in a moment about the Princess Royal, Anne, who has been with her mother at her side, uh, when she died, and then, of course, accompanying um, her coffin, and has been described as the hardest working uh, royal. And we will see her in uniform today. I also want to bring in Mark Phillips. He is outside Westminster Hall. And um, Mark, I mean, Westminster, one of the most hallowed places in, in, in London's history, the 11th century. Um, tell us all about it and, and what we'll see this morning. 
All right. But what we're looking at here is Westminster Abbey, where the funeral, of course, will take place on Monday. Just behind that is what they call the Westminster Parliamentary Precinct. And the oldest building in that is Westminster Hall. It is a fabulous building. Modern architects still can't figure out how it was built, what, 925 years ago. And it's been a kind of multifunctional government building for all of those years as well. In the early Norman period after the conquer of the, the William the Conqueror, uh, it served as the royal seat. Uh, there were periods after that where other uh, dynasties took it. Henry VIII, for example, had his coronation uh, banquet in there. It had sadder bits of history uh, as well. It's where the, tr the trial of Charles I, the first King Charles, was held uh, after the great civil war here and after which uh, he was beheaded. But in the time since since then, it's kind of become uh, what we would, would equate with the Capitol Rotunda uh, in Washington. It's been a place where great state occasions, where uh, lying in states would take place. We've already mentioned that Winston Churchill uh, lied in state there. The Queen Mother, uh, this deceased Queen's mother, uh, lay in state there as well. When notable personalities have come uh, into London to speak to the combined houses of Parliament, people like Nelson Mandela, popes, President Obama addressed both houses of, uh, of the British Parliament uh, in there as well. It's, it's, it's a building for all occasions, and when we see it, you will see why. It is really Mark. a terrific place. Mark, it is just about 9.22 in the east and 2.22 London time. And so this ceremony is just about to begin, timed precisely, as Wesley mentioned, as it will take 38 minutes to make their way to Westminster. Let's listen. Queen's coffin will be borne by gun carriage of the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery from Buckingham Palace here to Westminster. Let's bring in Julian Payne. And it's breathtaking seeing it. So, uh, yeah, it's a incredibly powerful moment we're seeing here. You can feel the emotion suddenly shoot up as we're seeing the military and catching our first glimpses now of the family. And again, that classic scenario where they are discharging their royal duties here. They're aware that they're on display, their military responsibility as well. And of course, at the same time, they are following the coffin of their mother on 
that final journey. So always that incredible um, two sides of, of feeling and emotion happening in their minds at the same time. And of course, in front of the coffin are members of their household, uh, including her private secretary, her master of the household, uh, the Queen's two pages, and of course the, uh, Lord, the palace steward. So all of those people that worked with her week in, week out, who looked after her in many ways week in, week out. Some of those roles, I can tell you, they are people that become almost like family themselves, such as the closeness and the proximity to the sovereign that they have in, in, in the duties that they discharge. So in many ways, both the front and the rear of the coffin are surrounded by family, but, but the two sides of, of her family, the work side and indeed the personal. Incredibly moving to see this, and of course, as you mentioned, those who worked closely with the Queen there, and then the Queen's coffin followed by a close family. There is the imperial crown. And the crown is actually sparkling as it goes past, but you can actually see the jewels sparkling and I, I remember seeing Her Majesty arriving at a banquet in Jamaica and there'd been a power cut and all you could see was her diamonds sparkling. Oh, it's so moving. She's just a few yards from us now. There are 2,868 diamonds oh, on that crown. So powerful. It's very upsetting actually, I must confess. And there but we really, see... Really, really powerful. Here come her children. the children. The king leading the procession. King Charles III, his sister separated by just one year, the Princess Royal Anne, then Prince Andrew in morning coat, and then Prince Edward. Tell me about the symbolism. Yeah, Holly, talk about the symbolism of this. Yeah, e extraordinary symbolism, Nora. Not just um, the coffin draped in the royal standard, that imperial state crown that Wesley just referenced, but the flowers on, on top of the coffin. We heard a little earlier from the palace um, that that wreath includes white roses and white dahlias, but also foliage from some of the Queen's residences. So pine from Balmoral. Uh, Balmoral Castle is, of course, where she died last Thursday. Uh, and lavender and rosemary uh, from Windsor Castle. I'm also just um, struck by the family members we can see walking behind the coffin. As you can see, the, the front row, those are all uh, her four children, Charles, Edward, Andrew and Anne. And then in the next row, uh, some of her grandchildren, uh, including both, both William and Harry. And I think that American viewers will be particularly interested to see Harry there. Of course, he was always going to be there just as he was present at his grandfather's funeral, walked behind his grandfather, Prince Philip's funeral uh, at coffin at, at his funeral last year. Um, but of course, Americans will be very conscious that in the last few days we've seen, we've seemed to see what may be perhaps the beginning of a kind of rapprochement, a mending of bridges uh, between Harry and Meghan uh, and the rest of the royal family. And he and his brother on this occasion are standing side by side, whereas at Prince Philip's funeral, Peter Phillips, Her Majesty's oldest grandson, Anne's son, was between them. So, so they're walking together on this occasion, which they haven't done through these streets since their own mother's funeral. I want to bring in Tina Brown on that, and Tina, just as yes. you see this incredible, incredible moment in history, and then to see these two brothers then united again in grief. It is so powerful because we do remember those images of them walking behind their mother's coffin. This is bigger than everybody. This is, the, this is so much bigger than any personal disagreements or discord. And it's also what they know, of course, is exactly what the Queen wanted and planned. She was enthusiastically involved in all of these plans. And it was always her wish to die in Scotland, and that managed to happen. And her wish to then travel you know, across her country, and she did, of course, first to St Giles and then on the plane back to London, 
to essentially say goodbye to her kingdom. And now she's doing the last piece of this incredibly sacred journey, which is to have be returned to the British people in the most formal way. And it is a very, it's very, you know, an extraordinary poignant to think of her imagining this moment as she was in those last weeks and having those meetings. Princess Anne was there for the last 24 years of her life and I think has shown huge gravitas and, and powerful stature during the last few days when she curtsied to her mother's coffin when it arrived, uh, you know, and when she simply has been with her throughout, you know, flying with her uh, from Scotland to London. Uh, they were very, very close and she's very close to Charles, who she's going to be, uh, I think, a very important counsellor to in the next few years because there's only, you know, a short amount of time between them when they were born and they're very close. Very close. And um, the Princess Royal, as you pointed out, someone who may not be as well recognized throughout the world, but someone who very close to her mother and well known throughout the United Kingdom as she engages in many of the engagements on behalf of the Crown. Yes, and she's also actually the most like her in many ways. You know, duty has been her whole life, and she's kind of an undersung and almost underappreciated because all she has done is work for the crown her entire life without any drama, whatever. Um, a countrywoman, very much, you know, like her mother also. You know, her, her daughter once remembers uh, how she used to come back from state uh, occasions in her ball gown and tiara and then just put on her wellies and go out and feed the chickens. <laughs> that you could imagine Elizabeth doing as well. Tina, I must ask you, because um, the Queen's popularity in the stratosphere, does it transfer to King Charles? Well, it seems to be. And, you know, what I think is fascinating here is to see Charles now swept along by his destiny at last. He's, he's trained for 50 years, and you see the impeccable way he's handled every piece of it. Um, he has waited for this moment, but now he's stepped into his destiny, and he's doing it with such incredible aplomb. He's being really greeted pretty rapturously now, and this is a kind of a claim that he's always wanted, actually. He's never really had. Uh, and it's remarkable to see it, that he's finally got the uh, sort of recognition, if you like, and, and the love, it seems, of the British nation in this remarkable historic hour. Julian Payne is also with us and had worked so closely with then Prince Charles, now the King. And Julian, this procession is part of the beginning of the goodbye that of course then ends with the state funeral on Monday, which will be attended by just about every world leader that can make it. Speak about what you think since That's you right. know and King in, Charles in... so well, what, what he's feeling today. Yeah, I think that, that, that this is a goodbye, this precise event we're seeing here, but it is also in some ways, it, it is part of the beginning of a new reign. And, Picking up on what Tina was saying, I think that when I worked with the King and, and discussed these things with him, his view has never been, this is something I want, this is something I'm, I'm impatient for. They look at it a different way. They, they accept that these roles are coming to them. They accept that they will do them and they will do their duty and give their service when the time comes. But I never had a sense that he was sitting there urgently waiting, willing this to come towards him, because of course that would also involve you willing the demise of your own mother, which of course, you know, naturally no, nobody would ever do. But it is, a, it, is a, it is an important distinction. All of the royal family are, are really schooled in duty and service. So it is some, it, these roles that they have, they take on when the time comes rather than counting down, if you like. Um, having his sister, as uh, Tina uh, also said, will be a, a huge um, boon for him. When you're in that role, naturally there are very few people who are going to be able to treat you in any way as a sort of equal or give you advice without fearing for their own position. I think certainly she will play a, a pivotal role. They, they grew up together. There's a 10 year difference between them and his younger brothers. So they naturally have more shared experience uh, as, a, as a pairing. The other person, of course, who we haven't talked about, who will be vital in that, is the new Queen Consort. 
uh, she is someone who will be able to continue to provide him with a huge amount of support as she has done over the last 17 years of their marriage and I expect as things move forward you'll have them as really significant people in his life as well of course as the new Prince of Wales who will be supporting him in discharging his duties. There is only one head of state but this is a royal family and by working together they can of course cover a lot more ground. And Julian, describe where the Queen Consort is, as well as other female members of the royal family. So the uh, female members of the family uh, departed slightly earlier and have headed to Westminster Palace, uh, ready to uh, greet the um, coffin and the other members of the family when it arrives. Traditionally, um, as Wesley alluded to before, it's been the male uh, members of the family that have followed the coffin. Of course, now we have the Princess Royal, uh, not only because of her military associations, but also because she is the daughter of the, um, of the Queen. But the other uh, female members of the family will uh, already be at the Palace of Westminster waiting to receive this party. Tina Brown is also with us, and we have seen the Queen Consort Camilla by the King's side in his travels throughout the United Kingdom, as well as his addresses to Parliament um, in Scotland and, of course, uh, in Britain. And what kind of Queen Consort do you think she'll be? I think that Camilla is going to be absolutely beloved. In some ways, she has something of the relatability of the Queen Mother, you know, who had so much charm and grace and humor. That's kind of very much like Camilla, really. I mean, I do feel that Camilla has that slight air of uh, almost sort of dazed, you know, sort of it's almost a surreal moment for Camilla because, you know, for most of her life, she never imagined herself in this role, whereas Charles, of course, has known this was going to be his role. So she's fulfilling her duties extraordinarily well, but also it's head spinning for her, I am sure, however much she has prepared for it. Now she has a, a whole measure of, of different kind of responsibility and a profile, obviously, than she did when she was Duchess of Cornwall. She is the Queen Consort, and she's you know in her 70s, and this has happened, and uh, she is you know it's her destiny kept as well, it seems. I am also just struck Tina in thinking about this that Queen Elizabeth is one of the final female matriarchs of the House of Windsor. Queen this Mary, is true. I the mean, Queen's actually, mother. I mean, what does that mean? Well, actually, you know, it turns out that women are very good at this job, all right? I mean, Queen Elizabeth <laughs> I, Queen Victoria, Queen Elizabeth II, and now we've got, you know, Charles, William, and, you know, everything going the same, you know, uh, King George. Uh, so, we, yes, it's going to be a long time since we have uh, another sovereign queen. And uh, perhaps that also, you know, contributes to the sort of sui generis, uh, astonishing, you know, halo, really, around Queen Elizabeth II. Well, that's what I'm struck by, because in conversations that I've had with, you know, uh, many academics and former prime ministers, the power in some ways of the Queen Elizabeth II's reign, not only her constancy and strength, but also her ability to use soft power, and most notably, of course, in Northern Ireland. And I want to bring Wesley in on that, um, because the significance of her reign as not only a, as David Cameron called it, the world's greatest public servant, but also a diplomat. Yes, I think Northern Ireland is a very good example of that domestically, and also the fight against apartheid would be another golden thread running through her reign and her role in the Commonwealth. So in Northern Ireland, having had that terrible thing happen of her um, cousin and Prince Philip's uncle, Lord Mountbatten, um, uh, killed in the most horrible bomb blast in August, 1979, and really it was a, almost a civil war and there were often explosions here. It's 40 years since soldiers were killed here in these parts in central London in, in explosions. But she led the reconciliation and was prepared to meet the leaders of, of the 
of Sinn Féin, um, some of whom it was thought had, had possibly supported some of these atrocities, but she was prepared to meet those same leaders. And you know, the visit to Ireland was, was an amazing triumph, the visit to the south of Ireland, the Republic, and for she meant many times the north of Ireland, of course, at least 20 times. Then in terms of her global role, um, the Commonwealth was very much pitched as an anti-racist organization, an organization in which the former empire, um, they, it, it, these became equal countries, independent countries, and very much she spearheading that personal friendship with Nelson Mandela, um, perhaps behind the scenes working to, to, to moderate the policies of Margaret Thatcher, um, who perhaps took a different line on sanctions against the South African regime. So, yes, there was soft power, but there was a very delicate and steely application behind the scenes of what we might call hard power. So, so Elizabeth had an agenda, but it was an agenda of anti-racism, harmony, people getting together. And for those that hear, that is Big Ben that is tolling. And while you hear some of the music from the band, the guns and the bell and the clopping of the horses, there is mostly silence on the streets there. We saw there's King Charles, of course, along with his siblings, the Queen's children, and then behind them, the grandchildren, including the heir to the throne, the prince, the new Prince of Wales, Prince William, and his brother, Prince Harry, who is not in military uniform. And I want to bring in Mark Phillips on that. And Prince Harry has weighed in on his dress for today. Yes, well, we've seen several uh, shots of the brothers uh, marching along. And what, what is interesting, uh, I think, to note here is that, well, this is a public ceremonial expression of, uh, of the family's grief. Uh, there are also protocols that are being observed here. Uh, some of the royals are in uniform. The king, of course, is uniform. Princess Anne is in uniform. Uh, Prince William, now the Prince of Wales, is in uniform. But uh, Prince Harry is not in uniform. He's in civilian clothes. And Prince Andrew is also not uh, in uniform. This was a, a kind of trade-off that was made. Uh, the, the family, in this moment of their expression of grief, uh, would be seen together. But because of the history, because of Harry's estrangement from the working royal family, because of Andrew's uh, history with Jeffrey Epstein and the child abuse uh, issues that that involved and the payout that he became involved in. He's been pretty well ostracized from uh, any kind of royal duties. Uh, and the expression of that on the streets here in this uh, spectacular uh, procession is that uh, he has to do it in civilian clothes along with Harry. Mark Phillips, thank you. I want to bring in Charlie Daggett because the procession has just passed where Charlie is along the route. Charlie? Yes. You know, we heard the band approach. Everybody started craning their necks and getting their cameras out. But then there was this quiet hush over the crowd. I'm going to try to keep my voice down myself to not spoil the moment for the service members here and the crowds who have gathered. The uh, coffin passing is right now, making its way down the mountain. You can see the people who are up further are following the funeral as it passes. But probably four or five rows of people uh, on either side of the Mall have been able to catch a glimpse. And it's not just to catch a glimpse of Her Majesty the Queen, but of King Charles, of the Princes Prince William and Prince Harry as they pass by. And I think it's, it's extraordinary to see how slowly this procession is moving. It took a couple minutes even to pass in front of us. So it really gives people an opportunity to, to witness it and to observe it, and it, it underlines a sort of solemn moment. I'm going to step out of the and, way and, thank and get you. a better and, look and, at it. And Charlie, as you mentioned, the Queen's cortege is passing actually a statue of King George VI, the Queen's father. I know Holly Williams wanted to talk about that. Holly? 
Yeah, Nora, this is probably stating the very obvious, but this sort of thing doesn't happen very often, and especially not when you have a queen uh, who's just reigned for 70 years. The last reigning monarch uh, that this country buried was the queen's father, George VI, in 1952. And actually, earlier today, I was watching some newsreel from the 1950s, um, showing his funeral, also showing him lying in state in 1952 in Westminster Hall, just as the Queen will uh, later today. Um, remarkably uh, similar uh, sort of ceremonial things going on. My understanding is that a lot of the, the things we're seeing today really date back uh, to the time uh, of Queen Victoria. Um, and I was actually speaking to uh, a British historian earlier who said that the planning for the Queen's funeral actually began almost immediately immediately after her father was buried, as British bureaucrats, bureaucrats started thinking about what went well, uh, what could have been done better. So you know, we've heard that they've been planning for this for years. It seems actually they've been planning for it for decades. And I should point out that it's also a massive security operation. Uh, around 10,000 police on the streets uh, helped out uh, by 1,500 uh, military personnel. And as we entered uh, this area earlier today, we went through airport-style security. Holly so you're there, seeing you now see. that the, the yes, thank Queen you, Wesley. consort leaving. They're seeing the Queen consort, um, the Princess of Wales, um, the Duchess of Sussex, the Countess of Wessex, and other senior female members of the royal family leaving um, from West, from from Buckingham Palace towards Westminster Abbey by a different route along Birdcage Walk, and they will get there in time to greet the male members of the royal family and receive the coffin formally. I also expect the Prime Minister and other senior dignitaries will be there and senior parliamentarians. So it will be the entire royal family um, greet, yes, greeting its matriarch and handing her on for the lying in state. So one difference between this funeral and then the king, um, George VI and his father, was that their, their actual funeral was in St George's Chapel, Windsor. So the lying in state was Westminster. They then went by train from Paddington. So what, what's very unusual is, is that Her Majesty's funeral will be at Westminster Abbey, but with the committal beside her father, mother and sister in a side chapel at St George's, Windsor. Wesley, stand by. I want to bring in Imtiaz Taya because he's right there where the, the cortege has just passed Horse Guards Parade. Imtiaz? Nora, you're absolutely right. In fact, I'm really just a few yards away from where the Queen's coffin passed by and, of course, King Charles III, uh, and as well as uh, other senior royals who are very somber looking as they walk past me. As you can see, many of the crowd now trying to follow uh, the procession as well. And uh, really, what we've been seeing here, Nora, is uh, a real sense of people feeling so moved by a queen who they've known for their entire life. Lives, this reigning monarch for, for 70 years. Uh, and the people we've been speaking to have been telling us that they wanted to celebrate her life well lived, but they also wanted to come here to say goodbye in their own way, a quiet goodbye. And one of the things that has really struck me while standing here for, for the time that we have been, Nora, is the number of families that are here, the number of children that are here. We talked to parents and we said, you know, why was it important for you to bring your children here? Why was it important for you to, to bring children, really, uh, toddlers even, uh, to, to this? And they said they wanted their children to say goodbye to the Queen, but also be part of this history. This, uh, in their view, was a history that was so important uh, to, obviously, this nation, the world, uh, but also for many of the people here. And uh, it's been pretty extraordinary to see uh, the kind of emotion we We've seen here, as we've been saying, it's been a mix of emotion. You have those who are feeling very sad, but you again, you have those who are celebrating this life uh, of Britain's longest reigning monarch, Nora. MTS tie up there. And now, Nora, you can hear a spontaneous round of applause. I don't know if you can hear this, Nora, but people are clapping spontaneously here uh, to applaud the Queen. And 
Again, it really is just such an extraordinary mix of emotions that we're seeing here as the Queen makes this final procession through this city, which she has called home for so long, and a nation she ruled over for so long. You can hear some people cheering as well, and it really just underscores uh, the mood here in Britain, which is not only are they saying goodbye to the Queen, they're also saying goodbye to the, uh, se you know, the second to Elizabeth Elizabethan era, and many people again say that they support King Charles III, that they wish him well, but they will forever and always remember Queen Elizabeth II. Nora. And Tiaz, that was so beautifully said, and um, I must say I got emotional myself hearing the applause there as the people thanking the Queen uh, for her service and acknowledging the members of not only the royal staff, but the royal family and, of course, the guards and many that are involved in this procession as they pass through the horse guards' arch. This mix of emotions today, and I want to bring in Tina Brown on this because, as we have been talking about King Charles III as well as the new heir to the throne, Prince William, united in grief with his brother, Prince Harry, the last time we saw them walk behind a coffin. It was their mother, Diana, 25 years ago. And at that time, William was just 15 years old. Harry was just 12 years old. And Prince Harry has remarked in years past that it was very difficult for him. We watched him which, with his hell, head hell, essentially dropped in grief. This is different. This is different. and. Essentially, it, it, it really is about the thread of history that continues. And that is actually why, of course, Prince Philip and the royal family so wanted the young princes to do that very difficult thing when they walked behind uh, their mother's coffin. Because it was that extraordinary show of those men, the royal men, you know, walking behind the coffin that was about continuity, that was the, the need to express that continuity of the monarchy, the constitution, that this is a this is the pageantry of of you know the British constitution being played out in the most extraordinary way, and uh, it's those symbols are so incredibly important to the sort of the march of history, if you like, and that's what we're seeing today. And I'm sure these thoughts are going through those boys' minds that they you know that they that this was what they did for for their mother, and of course they did it for Prince Philip when their relationship was expressed much more tensely, uh, you know, by the presence of, of their, their uh, you know, the, their cousin in between them. It's wonderful that they're walking side by side because it sends that message of this is so much bigger, um, this ceremony, than any, you know, temporary feud. This most solemn of public rituals, of course, and this procession is passing by some of the most familiar symbols of Royal London, from the palace to the tree line mall, then of course Whitehall, which we're seeing, and then 10 Downing Street before arriving at the Houses of Parliament. I want to bring in Julian Payne on that mix of emotions that we were talking about with Tina. Yeah, I think what really strikes me is this is a family that has seen many a great public occasion, and indeed when they travel around the world, they're very used to drawing a crowd. Uh, the younger you are, the more crowd you get usually. Uh, but this will be an extraordinary moment for all of them. I don't think that they will have um, seen anything like this themselves, of course, because it hasn't happened in so long. And when you add in the sort of poignancy of their own uh, circumstances, what this being their mother, their grandmother, this is, I know, something that they will feel is different, unique, and I am absolutely sure they'll be extremely touched. I know that the King has been very touched by the reaction he's received by the British public and indeed from well-wishers around the world. It's meant a great deal to him and the Queen Consort, and I'm sure it's extremely reassuring for, for all, all members of the family. So even for those for whom the big occasion is something they're quite used to, this is on another level. And Wesley, uh, London is one of the most beautiful cities in the world, and it's extraordinary just to see so many of between Buckingham Palace and Whitehall and Big Ben and 10 Downing Street and the Parliament, all of them close enough that this procession can be made. 
and these are all streets that I, I cycle down on other occasions or walk down, but what's unique about the British state is all these institutions are so closely entwined and so close together. So, so they've left the palace when they went through that arch, they were in the public domain. But Whitehall, of course, although once a former royal palace, is the centre of British government. They're about to pass by 10 Darling Street. Then they'll get to Parliament, and Parliament is opposite both the Coronation Church, Westminster Abbey, and the Supreme Court. So you've got all the institutions of the British state in one place, and they're all paying obeisance to this remarkable sovereign today. And there you hear Big Ben ringing more sonorously as they get close to it. So we're about to have the formal reception into Westminster Hall of this great sovereign. Another palace, but the Palace of Westminster Parliament. So here we're passing memorial to the women who contributed to the two world wars. And we're about to pass the great cenotaph built after the First World War to commemorate the many millions of people. And each year, that was one of the most important engagements in Her Majesty's diary, was Remembrance Sunday at the Cenotaph, where people from all the Commonwealth countries who also helped um, win that Second World War. Here we are at the great Cenotaph designed by Lutyens. That was so important for Her Majesty. So there's this connection with the past and now with modern Britain. And that's what the family and all these institutions symbolize. It's an amazing example of history and continuity. The arc of her life, spanning such an incredible arc of history in post-World War II. I want to bring in Mark She's Phillips. She's eight years after the end of the yeah. First World War. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I want to bring in Mark Phillips, uh, who is outside Westminster Abbey. And Mark, no one does pomp and circumstance like the British. Uh, it's, it's often been said that nobody does ceremony anywhere in the world like the House of Windsor does, and I think we're seeing just how well they do that sort of thing today on this very, very special occasion. This ceremony uh, combines so many things. It's, it's somber, but it's grand. You know, it's elegant, but it's heartfelt. Uh, it's ceremonial, but it's very, very personal, not just for the family that's part of the cortege, but also for the tens of thousands of people, as we've already seen, uh, who are lining the route. As you said, this has been a long time in the planning and the choreography of all of this, not just this procession, but everything that's happened since the Queen died last Thursday. The choreography is just mind-blowing, the number of pieces that have to be fit together, and thus far they've all fit together, you'd have to say, perfectly. We are just minutes away from the coffin arriving at the north door of Westminster Hall, where it will be carried inside by the Queen's Company, the 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, and then, of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, will conduct a short service. Let's listen in for a moment. joins us and I know Ramey you spoke with London's mayor this morning. Yes, I did actually just uh, about an hour ago. And you know, just uh, watching everything that's going on right now, uh, I just can't help but feel that um, you know, the, through the pomp and the pageantry of all the icons throughout the ages, we are seeing something that we will never, ever see again. And that is exactly what Mayor Sidi Khan told me. He was saying that uh, for Queen Elizabeth, uh, she was such an icon that she will be so missed. And that's why so many people are uh, gathering around the Thames, snaking around, as we were talking about, for nearly five miles, just on the other side of the banks here. Uh, Westminster Hall right behind me. And right here, across the street, is actually going to be the uh, front of the line for where those thousands of people will eventually uh, come to a head. Uh, they will then walk into Westminster Hall starting at 5 p.m. and going through the next four days. They're going to have to be going through uh, um, airport security-style screening. They uh, will also be uh, seen, watched over by guards. And uh, Sadiq Khan was saying that uh, the biggest thing that he will miss is Queen Elizabeth's humor and the sparkle in her eye uh, when they talked with each other. 
he also said that uh, she always seemed to be present, even if she wasn't really family, but everyone here in the United Kingdom still felt that because she was ever present, she was a part of everyone's family and everyone's grandmother. Nora. Mm. Also beautifully said. Um, thank you, Ramey. And for those that are even there along the river, some watching on their phones, no one wants to miss this moment in history. Tina, I'm struck by the applause. It's almost like a thank you. It is an enormous thank you because I think the Queen sort of so epitomized steadfastness and that is what people so appreciate in a world that is so splintered and volatile and clamorous at the moment with so much partisan discord. She stood above that partisan brawling and stood for the eternal sort of British values of, of stoicism and duty and service. Of faith was something that was enormously uh, you know, important to her. People also just related to the fact that aside from these great history epochs that she lived through, and let's not remember, she really is our last thread to World War II. One of her advisors said to me that D-Day, which to most people is just you know a history book uh, uh, memorial, for her was very personal. She always remembered her friends at that time and how they went off, you know, and she didn't know whether she would ever see them again. So she is the thread that connects them to that. Um, but she also had all this, uh, you know, she was the still center of her family, you know, that we always felt the drama and the sort of, you know, the, the turbulence and discord of her family would always be resolved in the end because she was there at the center of it, unchanging. And that sense that she isn't there at the center has left people feeling almost sort of spinning in space. And it, it is remarkable, though, how Charles has stepped into that space uh, with such a natural composure. It's, it's very, very uh, heartening. Thank you, Tina Brown. It is just after 3 o'clock in London, 10 o'clock on the East Coast of the United States, and we are witnessing the final moments of this procession where Queen Elizabeth II, just about 40 minutes ago, left Buckingham Palace, her longtime home where she grew up as a child, and of course where she worked. and. Now entering Westminster, Big Ben, and they will be greeted soon by family. I want to bring in Wesley again, a historian and former BBC correspondent. This is an emotional final moment. It is, um, for, for many people, the last sight for people that can't um, queue up. I mean, so this has enabled hundreds of thousands of people to see her. As I saw her arriving last night, com coming off the road, she went, the, the car went past my birthplace, and it was a very powerful moment. We burst into applause then. So as she arrives at Parliament, um, you hear Big Ben, and the tower that Big Ben is now in is called the Elizabeth Tower which is an extraordinary honor in her name. The other tower is the Victoria Tower. That's where she would enter to open parliament. So there will be the most, this will perhaps be the first of many memorials. She will be memorialized forever in this great parliament building where she's arriving now. It was just on Monday when we heard the new king address parliament talking about feeling the weight of history. Let's listen in.
party. Six paces outwards, march. Stand still. Barrow party, prepare to turn. Prepare to race. Race. Barrow party, inwards. Turn. Barrow party, prepare to turn. Turn. Barrow party, slow. March.
about to hear now from the Most Reverend and Right Honorable Justin Welby, the Lord Archbishop of Canterbury. O oh God, the maker and redeemer of all mankind, grant us, with thy servant Queen Elizabeth and all the faithful departed, the sure benefits of thy son's saving passion and glorious resurrection, that in the last day, when all things are gathered up in Christ, we may with them enjoy the fullness of thy promises. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in whom whosoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whoever, whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul, not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life, we may rest in him, as our hope is that our sister doth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day, we may be found acceptable in thy sight and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all who love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. As our Saviour Christ hath commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
O God, the protector of all who trust in thee, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us thy mercy, that thou, being our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not things eternal. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And to God's gracious mercy and protection, we commit you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And that concludes the service welcoming Queen Elizabeth II, Her Majesty, to Westminster Hall, where she will lie in state for four days. Tonight, members of the public will be allowed to come through and pay their respects in a line that already stretches for miles. There were an estimated 200,000 that came to pay their respects to the Queen Mum. Many say it could be close to a million or more that will try to visit Westminster Hall. I want to bring in CBS News Royal contributor Tina Brown. And um, Tina, this, what we saw today was a nationwide outpouring of grief and respect for the only monarch that many people have ever known. I found it just so enormously moving, <clears throat> just so hugely sacred a moment. And the sight of that coffin with that crown, the lonely crown, you know, glittering on top, you could not help but feel that at last this woman who gave her whole life to the nation's service is finally relieved of that lonely burden. And we can now let her go. Uh, and we're all saying thank you for what she did, because what she took upon her, when she inherited this burden from no, with no choice of her own. She said when she was crowned in, uh, in Westminster uh, Abbey by the Archbishop of Canterbury, he said, are you willing to take this oath of office of a coronation? And she said, I am willing. And just those words, the simplicity of those words, she was willing every day of her life, every day of her 70 years. And it's time for us to thank her now. Julian Payne is also with us. And Julian, we see the royal family gathered there, not only His Majesty King Charles III and the Queen Consort, um, the Queen's other children, but also the grandchildren, the new heir to the throne, Prince William, the Prince of Wales, his wife Kate, Princess of Wales, as well as Harry and Meghan standing in formation. How does this change the family? How does the monarchy change? Well, of course, the monarchy is continuous. So as one sovereign breathes their last, so the new monarch begins their reign. So for the institution of monarchy, that continuity that stretched back over a thousand years continues without a single break point. But what we'll now see is the family realigning around the new head of the family, which of course is King Charles III. And you've seen that in some of the messages that the new Prince of Wales and the Duke of Sussex have said. They pledged their loyalty to the new king. I think that's incredibly important. I think it's very reassuring for people to see that. And I think gradually, as the nation says goodbye to this incredible monarch, so they will start to align around the new one. And I, I would just add one thing. 
This is an incredibly important time for the British public to say goodbye to the monarch themselves. That moment when they get some closure, when they get to say thank you. You can't underestimate in this country how all of us that care about the monarchy feel about that. And it's a really, really powerful opportunity that people will have over these next four days to do exactly that. Wesley Kerr is also with us, and Wesley, this is, continues to be an elaborate service inside. Describe what we're seeing. Um, the, these uh, officers are going to take up guard around the catafalk, as it's called. Um, later on, we, we will see the Queen's children also sy symbolically take up guard. But, but they're handing her over to the nation. And it's been, I will never forget today, it's been an incredibly poignant mix of, of the stately, the ceremonial, a family at the heart of it, and that religion at the heart of it. Religion was so important to Elizabeth II. I would see her drive alone on a Sunday to church or just with a guard to, to the little chapel she would worship in. So, so, so it, it, it's just incredibly powerful. It, it's ceremonial. But it's that these are children looking up at their mother, and this is our nation um, saying goodbye to our matriarch. And it's good that there's a few more days for people to say their personal goodbyes as the ceremonial continues. That's right. It, she will lie in state for four days so the public can say goodbye. And then on Monday, September 19th, there will be the funeral in Westminster Abbey where leaders from around the world will gather. We have just learned that President Biden spoke today with King Charles III okay. to offer his condolences. And want to bring in Mark Phillips, who's there outside the Abbey. Mark? Just kind of some final reflections here. Whether you're a monarchist or not, this is the kind of event that really demonstrates what the role of the monarchy is in this country. It's kind of the encapsulation of the soul of the nation, the image of the nation. It's a personality that people can feel an affinity to without any political mix one way or the other. This was a kind of unabiding and a kind of uncorrupted show of affection for a woman who everybody feels has done as good a job as possible to do over the longest period where it's ever been done. We keep saying that, but it's worth worth repeating. This was a very fitting, somber, yet heartfelt uh, procession, and now there'll be four days where the crowds are expected to be enormous, as many as you say, perhaps up as far as a, as a million people uh, coming to express their affinity uh, to this remarkable woman. Holly Williams, your quick thoughts. Uh, Nora, I was struck by the, the young choristers singing during that service. What extraordinary memories they'll take from this. I was also struck by the very prominent place of Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. This funeral seems to have helped bring this family together. And what more can you hope for from a funeral? That it, uh, it brings a family together uh, and brings a nation together. After the four days of lying in state, the Queen's funeral will take place Monday at Westminster Abbey. Queen Elizabeth will then be brought to St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle to be laid to rest alongside the Queen Mother, King George VI, her sister Princess Margaret, and her husband Prince Philip, who died in April last year. Our coverage will continue on CBS Streaming, your local news, and we'll have a full wrap-up tonight on the CBS Evening News. Many of you will return now to CBS Mornings. And on Monday, we'll have full coverage of Queen Elizabeth's II State Funeral at Westminster Abbey. This has been a CBS News special report as we watch King Charles III and the Queen Consort thank the Archbishop of Canterbury as he begins his new reign. For all of our colleagues around the world, I'm Nora O'Donnell.